Well, hello and welcome to our express service. Uh, today is Sunday, the 9th of January. Uh, it's so good to have you uh, with us. I'm David Hall, the vicar here at Christ Church, and I really do look forward to these services, and I'm so glad uh, to be with you right now. Let's pray, and then I'll do our Bible reading, our talk, and, uh, and we'll carry on. Oh, loving Lord, we thank you. Thank you for this time and this space. We thank you that you've brought us together as we now look at your most holy word and as we reflect on it and think about what it might mean for us personally. So loving God, we pray that you will be with us now. Your Holy Spirit will open our eyes to the wonderful truth that we're going to read and guide us in your footsteps, we pray, for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, our Bible reading is taken from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. Luke chapter 2 verses 22 to 40, and I'm going to be reading it from the English Standard Version. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they, that is Mary and Joseph, brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your soul also, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with spirit, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Loving God, just as surely as we have opened your word, please open our minds and our hearts to its truth that we might see wonderful things in your law. This we ask for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, we're looking at these verses from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to uh, 40, and we're looking at them under the title, Are You Ready? for the challenges of this coming year. Are you ready for the challenges of this coming year? Now we're looking at a major passage from the early life of Jesus when he's presented at the temple for the very first time, right at the beginning of his life. And of course, none of us know the challenges that we'll face in the future or how we're going to react. Uh, one of my wife, uh, Mary's sisters, was overheard by her mother praying she, when she was just four years of age. And this was her prayer. Dear God, I'll never be naughty again. There was then a pause, and she started again. Dear God, help me not to be naughty tomorrow. That's much more realistic, isn't it? 
I wonder what prayers and promises you've made to God over the years and indeed now for the future. I want to look at four people uh, closely connected to the early life of Jesus and they all have one thing in common. They are ready for the future. They are ready for the future. Wouldn't that be a good thing to have right now at this time? First, Mary and Joseph. They are ready to worship, ready to worship. Verse 22, and when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. The arrival of a firstborn child or son in a devout Jewish household would be accompanied by no less than three ceremonial events. First of all, circumcision, which would be carried out on the eighth day when the boy would receive his name. Secondly, what's called the redemption of the firstborn. Now this dated back to Numbers 18. Every firstborn son was regarded as sacred to the Lord. Uh, and in, this was done, it, the ceremony was done in recognition that he had the power to grant life. And of course, pagan worship uh, kind of very much featured the opposite. Children would be sacrificed and killed. So it was tacit recognition, if you like, within this ceremony of the redemption of the firstborn that, uh, that, uh, that pagan gods brought death. Um, but actually God himself brought life. Now, parents recognized that the firstborn belonged to the Lord by paying the sum of five shekels to buy back their son from God. And of course, this is, this is beautifully picked up in the symbolism of the cross, where God sacrifices his son to buy us back, to redeem a people for himself. The third ceremony surrounding the birth of a firstborn son would involve what's called purification after childbirth. After childbirth, a mother was ceremonially impure according to Old Testament law. And after 40 days, she was to go to the temple and bring a lamb as a burnt offering and a young pigeon as a sin offering. The problem was that lambs were expensive. So if a family could not afford a lamb, they had to bring a second pigeon instead. So by bringing two pigeons, Jesus' parents here are bringing what was called the offering of the poor. And it would have been obvious to anyone watching that this family had nothing. Everybody would have known they had nothing and that Jesus was living in a home where every penny counted and there were no luxuries. And I think that's quite comforting if we're living in any kind of financial difficulty or discouragement to know that Jesus knew <clears throat> what it was like to live in that kind of environment. How poignant, isn't it, that Jesus' parents could not afford to present a lamb at the temple and suffer the social indignity of making the poor offering. And yet, by presenting Jesus, they presented the best lamb that has ever been presented in that temple, a lamb without spot or blemish. Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. No other lamb is required. I suppose, in a sense, the actions of Mary and Joseph sum up worship. We bring the offering of our hearts and the offering of our lives. We bring that to God, and it looks inadequate. But through Christ, God graciously chooses to accept it. So Mary and Joseph are ready to worship. Are you ready to worship God this coming year? Simeon, my next character here in this story, is, on the other hand, ready to die. Um, that's a pretty serious heading, ready to die. I'm reminded of a grim Armenian proverb, which goes, the past is terrible, the present is catastrophic. Thank goodness we don't have a future. But there is such a thing, isn't there, as ready to die. My dear father-in-law, Gordon Bridger, passed away just before Christmas. He was a wonderful man, a great pastor and preacher. No one could be better prepared to meet God than he was. He was ready to die. What do we learn from Simeon about being ready to die? Verse 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, <clears throat> and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, 
And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. The defining spiritual characteristic of Simeon is patience patience. He is in verse 25 waiting for the consolation of Israel, that is the comforting of Israel and the sending of its Messiah. He also has a remarkable and unique experience of God. Uh, we're told that he was righteous and devout in verse 45 and that it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit in verse uh, 26 that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. We're also told in verse 27 that he came in the Spirit to the temple. This is an amazing experience of God. There's no biblical record of, of anyone in the whole of Israel having this kind of closeness of experience of God. None of the apostles are ever described in these terms. I think there's a learning here. Do not allow your experience of God to be defined by others. He wants to reveal himself to you as an individual. Be righteous, which means living a godly life. Be devout, that means being faithful in reading God's word and praying to him. And be open to what the Holy Spirit may say or may do for you. Simeon is clearly a man who put in first the kind of hard spiritual work. And then he had a wonderful experience of the Holy Spirit. But you know what? We prefer things the other way around often, don't we? We want a wonderful spiritual experience first. And if it's good enough, hopefully, we hope it'll kind of encourage us into putting the hard work for God in afterwards. But it didn't work that way around for Simeon. Why should it work that way around for us? What we're watching here is the culmination of Simeon's work in his relationship for God. Verse 27, And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. These are wonderful words, aren't they? Simeon has no official position in the temple. He's not a prophet or anything the way that Anna's described. He's not described as having any job at all. And as far as I can tell, he's just an ordinary guy. Yet his work for God is complete. And that is why he is ready to die. When your time comes to die, will your work for God be complete? Will you have served him as he has called you to serve him? May we all be ready. May we have all completed all the work that we are called to do when that time comes. So Simeon is ready to die. Um, Mary and Joseph are ready to worship. Simeon's ready to die. But Anna, the last of the characters I want to look at, Anna, she is ready to live. She is ready to live. Um, it was voted the most iconic image of all time. It was a picture of screaming children after a napalm attack in Vietnam, which went all around the world. It provoked outrage. And the child, the girl at the center of the picture, running naked and frightened uh, through a street, uh, through a big open country road in Vietnam, uh, her name was Kim uh, Phuc. And she was labeled by the world napalm girl. After three days of hovering near death, she slowly started to heal physically, at least in part. But the scars in her mind remained. She said this, I was raised in a traditional Keo Day, the traditional Keo Day religion. Um, and when she gave her testimony some years later, she said, but because of the bombs, she said, I had difficulty in my spiritual journey. I kept asking myself, why do you have to suffer this much? She said, I remember sitting outside on a bench, looking up at the sky, yelling at God. Are you really there? Do you exist? If so, please help me if you are real. 
I need you. I need a friend that I can talk to and I can share my burden with. She said this, one day I was in a library in Saigon uh, and I spent days uh, studying and reading religious books and I found a New Testament and I read John 14 verse 6 where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. She said, after many questions from me, my cousin invited me to church. I am so glad I accepted the invitation. She said, the pastor spoke about Jesus dying on the cross for our sin, and that if we accepted Jesus as our personal savior, that he will come into our hearts and bring peace. In that moment, she said, I knew I needed that peace. I went to the altar, I opened my heart, I accepted Jesus. And the more I prayed, the more I had peace. I pray for joy, for wisdom, and more than anything, for forgiveness. I had so much anger in my heart. And while sometimes I failed, I prayed that God would help me. She ended by saying, as a child, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I remember thinking, now I am in the right place at the right time. I understand I have the power to help people because I understand other victims of tragedy. I believe God looked down and said, I'm not finished with that little girl. I have a plan for you. And she ended by saying, my scar reminds me that God is with me. Here in this story, this true story here, of the events surrounding Jesus in the temple, Anna is in the temple. She is the right person in the right time at the right place. And whatever she has suffered, God is with her. This is how it's described in verse 36 of our reading. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer, night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now the backdrop of Anna's actions here is heartbreak. If she married, say, by around about 18, which was common then, she would have spent the next 66 years of her life as a widow. Now there's always an excuse available, isn't there, to be bitter and to be unproductive for God. But Anna would have had more excuse than almost anyone else to be bitter and to be unproductive for God. How could a God of love have taken her husband uh, away after just seven years together? Now, we have no control over a bad thing which has happened. That it occurs at all is down to a comple complex interaction between human frailty, God's sovereignty, and this fallen world. That it occurs in the past means it cannot be undone. But we have full responsibility for how we respond. The future is everything. And it seems here that God has done something amazing in Anna's heart, where this could so easily have been spiritual bitterness. Where there is, or where there could have been, there is instead spiritual beauty. She has been prepared for this moment. She has prepared for this moment. Verse 37, by worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And now when Jesus is brought into the temple, now is her time to step forward. We're told in verse 38, coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. The world is waiting for redemption. What is God calling us to begin this year? Will it feature thanksgiving? Will it speak, feature a speaking of Christ to others, as, as indeed Anna's witness did? You may feel you, you face a number of difficulties and challenges this year, but look at Anna. She's 84. She's been a widow probably 66 years. But Anna is ready to live. So as I conclude, we, we leave this temple full of rejoicing people. Mary and Joseph, ready to worship. Simeon, ready joyfully uh, to die. And Anna, ready to live. They're all now in eternity. Their life's work is complete. It's your time now. Maybe this year brings both significant challenges and significant opportunity, let us ask God to help us to get ready for this coming year. 
Amen. Let's bow our heads. So what I'm going to do is just take a little moment of quiet. Maybe you might want in your hearts to think about one sort of significant challenge coming up this year and one opportunity and ask God to help you with those. I'm just going to take a little, little moment of quiet to allow you to do that. And then I'm going to pray around the message of this passage and our service will close as, uh, as this service closes with, with a song. And let's do it. Let's bow our heads. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for Mary, Joseph, Simeon, and Anna, but above all, for Jesus Christ, their Lord and mine. Thank you also that the Holy Spirit was present in power in that temple in that moment 2,000 years ago. Thank you that you are Lord of eternity, and in the power of the Spirit, you are present here right now. Help me seize this moment of opportunity and face the challenges of this coming year with thanksgiving and the message of Christ in my heart and in my life for the sake of your Son, my Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And just as we bring our service to a close, uh, a final blessing before we go to our closing song. May the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love now and evermore. Amen. Six.